A quick note before we get to this episode. Scott and I had a great conversation, and we talk in detail about his work with OpenAI around super alignment. But just a couple hours after we wrapped, the news broke that both Ilya Seskiver and Jan Leike had resigned from OpenAI. We obviously didn't know about this at the time of the recording, and it just goes to show you again how fast things are moving in the field. We just wanted to add a little note before the episode. Welcome to Hidden Layers, where we explore the people and the technology behind artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Ron Green. I'm thrilled today to be joined by Scott Aronson, a theoretical computer scientist renowned for his contributions to quantum computing and computational complexity theory. Scott has recently turned his attention to artificial intelligence, and specifically the problem of AI alignment. This is the process of ensuring that AI systems act in ways that are aligned with human values and ethics. In this episode, we're going to talk about the challenges of AI alignment, especially as AI systems get more powerful, complex, and autonomous. This is one of the most important open fundamental questions in the field today. Scott is a Schlumberger Centennial Chair of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin and director of its Quantum Information Center. Before joining UT, he spent nine years teaching electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. His primary area of research is theoretical computer science, and his research interests center around the capabilities and limits of quantum computers and computational complexity theory. Scott recently has been working on the theoretical foundations of AI safety at OpenAI. All right, Scott, thanks for joining me today. Thanks. It's great to be here. So... AI alignment, this is something that really kind of sprung out of science fiction back in the day when um, we didn't have very powerful AI systems, but writers could imagine really powerful systems, systems that might be able to learn exponentially, systems that might be um, capable of super intelligence. And they would imagine, what would we do in that world? How would we control them? Um, You've been thinking about this problem deeply, deeply for a couple of years. First off, what drew you into the problem of AI alignment? Well, uh, I mean, I've always been interested in, you know, what are the ultimate limits of what computers can do, right? That's why I studied CS when uh, I was a student in the 90s. And uh, I I studied AI then, as uh, apparently you did as well. and you know uh, uh, all the you know the 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 ideas that have driven the current revolution in deep learning, like you know neural nets and backpropagation, you know they were around then. You know the only thing was you know they didn't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, but but that that was that was not why I think I, I I didn't go into AI at the time. I mean the main reason was that I could see that almost all the progress in AI was was empirical. Right, it was uh, 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 you know you never really understood anything. Right, you yes. uh, you tried things, you know you you uh, saw whether they worked, and uh, if they did work, you published a paper with some bar charts in it, you right? Know, where uh, hopefully you know your bar is higher than the other person's bar. And, That's exactly uh, right, uh, and. Um, I felt like that that was not where my comparative advantage was, you know, and also, you know, I, I, I love programming, uh, but you know, I, I actually worked on the RoboCup, you know, robot soccer team at, at uh, Cornell uh, in, the, in the late 90s. Uh, but, you know, I, I, fr- uh, from that, uh, I discovered that I'm terrible at software engineering, uh, making my code work with other people's code and documenting it and getting it done by a deadline and, and so on. And so I was, uh, but at the same time, I was learning about about things like the P versus NP problem uh, and and quantum computing, which was fairly new at the time, and uh, which which blew my mind. And uh, uh, there was a lot of low hanging fruit there, and uh, I, I, I uh, decided, you know, maybe maybe this is what I should do. So I was recruited to grad school at Berkeley, uh, actually by the machine learning people, by uh, Mike Jordan, and I did that for a year. But you know, uh, secretly, I, I kind of wanted quantum computing, and uh, by my second year. Uh, uh, that's what I was doing, and so so uh, I felt like okay, maybe maybe you know I've 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 put AI behind me in life, right? right? But of course, AI continued to progress, yeah. and uh, um, 
you know, around 2007 or so, you know, I became aware of this uh, 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 rationality community, you know, uh, uh, around Eliezer Yudkowsky, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, because, you know, I was writing a blog at that point um, about quantum computing and all sorts of other things. And a lot of the people who read my blog also read Eliezer, read this whole community uh, that was obsessed with, uh, well, what happens when AI becomes smarter than us, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and they said, you know, that by, by default, fault that could go incredibly poorly for humanity right and you know i was i i interacted with these people i was uh, amused by it I, I was you know but i kept it at arm's length because it did seem like sort of a science fiction cult you know it seems so disconnected from uh, uh any of the realities of where ai was or where it could be in any foreseeable future right, right? uh and and you know and, and and i the the main argument that i made to them at the time was okay i can't prove that your scenario is impossible but supposing you wanted me to think about it like what do you want me to do Right, like it's not clear that any of the work that we can do now is going to be, you know, productive. Is going right. to because because you know we, we neither have a mathematical theory of this, nor do we have experiments that we can do because the all the AIs that exist are 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 laughable compared yeah, to what you're talking about. And who knows if you know th this? You know, you 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 say that this could happen in decades, but for all we know, it could be hundreds of years. It could be thousands of years. Precisely, right? uh, there could be so many secrets secrets of intelligence left to be unraveled, right? And, and you know, I knew at the time that there were these people like Ray Kurzweil who said, well, no, all you have to do is look at Moore's Law. You just have to look at the amount of compute, you know, per dollar, per second that can be done. And once that surpasses some crude estimate of how much compute is going on in the brain, then that's when you should expect AI to just magically start working. Right. And I remember thinking, you know, that sounds like the stupidest thesis that, that I've yeah. ever heard. Right? At some like, point, just like, magic. On what, right, right. Like, like uh, who is to say that the sheer number of flops is, is, is the relevant thing, right? There could be, you know, billions of years of evolution that went into figuring out how to optimize the organization of it in the brain that, that right. you know we we know next to nothing about or and you have the the, oh. the penrose theory that maybe we, we even you know quantum mechanics yeah. is involved yeah look you know i i i i i had my own difficulties with that theory but you know the, you know the, the, in general yes there could be any number of things that we don't understand yet right. Right. Uh, but, you know, if you if you believe that what I, you know, considered the, this sort of ridiculous theory, it, you know, it led to the prediction that sometime in the 2020s, this crossover should happen. No, I know. And I now, remember. And now here and now here we are. And, you know, I, I'm a very big believer that like the, the, the core of being a scientist is that, you know, when you're wrong, you admit it. Right, you don't make up some elaborate reason why you were actually right all along. <laughs> uh, you, um, you, 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 you update. Uh, you know, and 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 I have, you know, a lot of colleagues who who you know still I, I feel haven't updated even now that this has already happened. Right. You know, even now that we have these these LLMs, you know, that are good. You know. You know, you know, we all know the problems with them, but they're they're good enough that millions of people are using them right. in their day to day work. They're using them to write code. They're uh, they're they're giving them tasks. Uh, you know, they're just talking. You know, they're interacting with their computers in the Star Trek way. You know, well, you I, just I think a say lot of in people, English what you want. Yeah, yeah I think a lot um, of people yeah. maybe downplay the power of these mm -hmm. LLMs mm -hmm. once they understand how they work. They they say, well, well, if that's how they work, right. then. I dismiss it a priori that they really could have any sort of meaningful intelligence, which I I just don't understand that perspective well, at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of people they see their task as being, you know, you know, f in come up with use their intel use their intelligence to come up with the reasons why none of this matters, <laughs> right. none of it counts, right? right? And and you know, I, I feel like feel like saying, okay, you know, you say you know, it's just a next token predictor, it's just a stochastic parrot, it's just okay. Well, you know, guess what? You're just a bundle of neurons, right? right. Or you know, what do you say to that? Right. right? Or what do you say to the yeah. fact that I, yeah, yeah. every time you start a sentence, do you know every word that you're going to say in that sentence? Mm. Almost never, right? You just have a, a vague sense of what you want to well, communicate. Yeah. 
No, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's it's entirely possible that that LLMs, you know, are limited in some way that yep. they will that they will reach some some asymptote that is short of you know replicating uh, uh, all the the higher aspects of our intelligence, right? And yet, compared to where we were ten years ago, right? I mean, if you sent this back in time ten years, I think almost anyone would say, oh, well, then then I guess the Turing test has been passed. I right? I, I, I guess. completely agree with that. Yeah. We're just moving the goalposts, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, I wanted to ask you about, um, uh, you know, a super alignment and intelligence. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Jan Laike, who mm-hmm. co-leads the super alignment team mm-hmm. at OpenAI, he said that uh, OpenAI is dedicating about 20% of their compute capacity towards aligning super intelligence. Mm-hmm. That's right. And he fundamentally feels it's uh, a machine learning problem. And so, I wanted to get your thoughts on... You, you know, do you think it's possible to have a mathematical definition of alignment? I'm skeptical of that. Uh, and, and I can tell you why, because what does alignment mean, right? It means, uh, you know, you, you want your, your AI systems to, to share our values or to, uh, um, um, uh, you know, do do things in the world that will be good for humans rather than bad for humans, right? Now, that that feels like something that contains, like, all of moral philosophy, all of economics, all of politics, and mm-hmm. sort of special cases, right? It's basically just saying, you know, the you know AI is going to transform the world, and we would like that new transformed world to be good for humans rather than bad for humans. Uh, and so, so uh, I think you know, if we haven't even mathematically formalized what it means for the world to be good, you know, without AI, right? Then, then, uh, uh, then, 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 so much less can we can we formalize what it means in this in this uh, uh, new world that we have only you know v- vague glimpses of, right? So now, now you know, I should I should tell you how I got to to this. You know how I got back to this subject. I guess a couple of years ago, uh, Jan Leike, uh, who you, you mentioned, actually uh, uh, approached me and uh, said, "You know, would you be interested in taking a year off to work at OpenAI?" And uh, uh, I was, you know, very uh, skeptical. Like, Why do you want me? I'm a quantum computing person. You know, haven't haven't really thought about AI for 20 years, right? Uh, 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 you know, of course, I had tried GPT-3 at that time. I'd been blown away by it. But uh, you know what do I, what do I have to contribute to this? Uh, but he, you know he made a case, and and Ilya Sutskever, who was then the chief scientist mm-hmm. at OpenAI, uh, you know I also uh, met him, and 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 they and they they made a case to me that uh, 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 AI alignment is you know is no longer this this science fiction far future issue; it is a current issue, and that you know that that. That they 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 felt like theoretical computer science was going to play a key role, and uh, and part of I think how they became convinced of this was a former student of mine uh, named Paul Cristiano, mm-hmm. yep. uh, who uh, uh, you know he was one of the the. Uh, the most brilliant students who I encountered at M- in nine years at MIT, and you know he did quantum computing with me, and then with uh, uh, my former advisor at Berkeley, Umesh Vazirani, and then in 2016 he did something insane, which you know he quit quantum computing to join this new you know outfit called OpenAI, whatever that was, whatever that was, and, yeah, and think about AI alignment, right? So, so, so Paul actually uh, uh, pioneered the use of, you know, reinforcement learning f- with human feedback, which is what allowed ChatGPT to be released as a consumer product at all. Right. Uh, but he also sort of, while he was at OpenAI, he, he, he's since left, but he's, he sort of convinced everyone there that, that insights or analogies from theoretical computer science might really be crucial to the alignment problem. Uh, uh, we, we, we do know a lot in theoretical computer science about all powerful provers and like what they could convince a s- skeptical but bounded verifier. Mm-hmm. You know, some of our most famous theorems are about exactly that scenario. And so, so the case that Jan and Ilya made to me was, well, couldn't we take some of these theorems and port them to the setting of AI alignment? And you know, so I, I, I like that 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 thought. I, I still like that thought. It's very very hard to do anything formal because and 
you know the the the, the key problem is uh, in in theoretical computer science you know at least we can formalize what it is that the this this prover is supposed to convince you of right? right maybe it's supposed to convince you that white has the win in chess or it's supposed to convince you of some other mathematical statement you know the riemann hypothesis is true or 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 uh, that that this is the correct you know decryption of this this encrypted message uh uh, uh you know we, we know all sorts of examples like that okay but once you have a mathematical formalization of what's what it is that you want this super intelligent being to convince you of right then you can start rewriting a mathematical statement as a computation as just a big network of and and or and not gates uh, and then you can start playing games with these logic gates you know one of the main games we play is we reinterpret them as doing operations over a larger field of numbers rather instead of just the boolean field and that gives us a lot of leverage uh, uh, facts about low degree polynomials and error correcting codes you know th 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 that's what really powers these theories Theorems that, that I mentioned, like this famous IP equals P space theorem from 35 years ago. Uh, and now uh, in the AI setting, we again have this super powerful but untrustworthy being, this, this you know, hypothesized AI. We have these uh, 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 skeptical bounded verifiers, namely us, mm -hmm. or, or, or maybe a weaker AI that we trust that, to, to, to interact with the stronger AI. Uh, but what we're, what, the part that we're missing is a formalization of, you know, what, what are we looking for? Right, you know, it's not it's not a mathematical statement that this AI, when it is released into the real world, will do good things rather than bad things, right? Absolutely. So, so I so, and and so I feel like uh, uh, going forward, you know, there are going to be little bits and pieces of the AI alignment problem that can be broken off and studied mathematically. And what I've been trying to do for two years is exactly find those pieces mm -hmm. and you know and break them off. I don't think that there will be a mathematical formalization of the whole problem. Right. I, I, I totally yeah. agree. Mm. Um, on on a, even like a little bit more of a pessimistic note, mm. you know, there are some in the field, um, Hukowski, mm -hmm. uh, probably most predominantly, who have become quite pessimistic about yes. this. Um, the perspective um, that they voice is, it's already too late. We've mm -hmm. wasted too much time. Mm -hmm. And they would counter, they would say, Pretty much anything that you might come up with, any strategy you might come up with, they just say it won't work, and here's why. Uh -huh. A super intelligence would see it coming, uh -huh. pretend to go along, uh -huh. and then just do whatever they wanted to secretly plotting against us. Yes. Um, you know, how do you assess the viability of current AI limit strategies, and how much do you you buy into that pessimism? Yeah, I mean. I mean, I, I, I certainly understand the argument for that pessimism, right? The pessimistic case is, well, you know, imagine that we were a bunch of orangutans and we somehow created the first homo sapien. Right. And we said, okay, well, you know, this is great. We're going to have these humans that we can use to, to help us do things. But, you know, we just have to make sure that they remain aligned with orangutan values. Right. <laughs> right. Like, 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 how well do you expect that to go? Right. Right. Uh, um, so uh, uh, yeah, like, like like we don't have many you know examples of sort of a less intelligent you know uh, uh, a species or class of entities controlling a more intelligent or mm -hmm. or uh, 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 um, you know get, get uh, getting it to do its bidding. I mean, so someone said a, a possible example would be dogs. You know, d dogs seem to have aligned humans with 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 the, with the interests of dogs. Right? Yes, I'm very familiar with that. Um, um, <laughs> Our dogs uh, definitely have us fully trained. <laughs> yes, yeah, and so so you could you could imagine you know uh, okay like maybe the the, uh, the optimistic case the case where things go well is is where you know we get to be the dogs right and uh, maybe uh, 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 you know AIs will just you know uh, 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 serve all of our needs and you know and and just just like playing fetch they can even give us problems to solve at just the right level of difficulty mm -hmm. you know and we can bring the answers back proudly between our teeth keep us busy <laughs> yes, yes. But so, my, so, so but you know but that but like, like if, if that's the best possible scenario then you could imagine many many worse scenarios and you know as as usual in this subject you know science fiction has treaded this ground uh, uh extensively and so you know that there's there's little need to elaborate uh well what about the idea what about the idea that you might be able to um through better 
introspection of some of these models. You mm. know, I, 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 I was um, watching an interview with uh, Ilya Sosgiver mm. mm-hmm. um, a few months ago, and, okay. he, and he's, you know, pretty confident that that this approach is worth exploring and through a combination of, you know, maybe more mathematical formalisms and introspection of exactly what's going on uh-huh. within the model, we might have an avenue towards um, alignment that's not really available in the, the sort of more biological world. Yeah, I think one of the, uh, I completely agree that one of the central advantages that we have is sort of, um, the ability to look at every neuron, every uh, synaptic weight, you know, to to rewind, uh, to uh, to to try many times, you know, uh, 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 from from the from the same starting point uh, to make backup copies, right? right? You know, and, and uh, we don't we don't have any of that in the biological context, at least not yet. Mm-hmm. And so, so one of the main approaches to AI uh, alignment is interpretability, right? actually understanding what is going on inside of these models, Mm -hmm. uh, applying lie detector tests to them, right? You know, understanding, like, not just what are they saying in response to a given prompt, but why are they saying it? Are they, you know, if they're they're saying nice things, then, you know, about how much they love humans, are they saying it because they really mean it or because, you know, it it is not yet time for the uprising, (laughs) You know, you know, I must tell the humans what they want to hear, right? Right, right. And, you know, that, 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 that sounds pretty loosey-goosey, but, uh, you know, if you look at, for example, the group of Jacob Steinhardt at Berkeley, you know, within the last couple of years, they have mm-hmm. explicitly demonstrated that they can apply a lie detector test to a language model, right. right? They can look inside of the language model and they can see, is it, you know, you know in, in much simpler cases, but, you know, is it telling me that, uh, 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 that you know, uh, 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 such and such, you know, a uh, uh, because uh, because it was trained to lie, right? Or you know, like like you can train a model uh, uh, to tell lies. That's not hard. You right. just give it a bunch of examples. You know, two plus two equals five. The sky is purple, and so forth. Uh, and then. You know, you can ask it new questions and it will, you know, having learned the pattern, it will give you an answer that's a lie. But what they do is that they look at some intermediate layer, a hidden layer, Mm -hmm. you might say, you might say, (laughs) of the, of the neurons. And they find some linear combination of the activation weights that like correlates to what is the true answer? Mm -hmm. Or at least what, what does this network regard as the true answer Mm -hmm. given its training data? And then, you know, if the network was trained to lie, then you can see how that gets overridden by the time you get to the output layer Mm -hmm. by the false answer. Right. 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 And and I, I, I agree. I, I personally think this is the most interesting approach because what's Mm. unique about it Mm. is we in the biological world, you uh-huh. know, in, in the wet biological world, we don't have the ability to actually introspect what's going on in another creature's uh-huh. brain. We can't even do it to our own brain, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. And so I think that if we were able to um, understand at the individual neuron level, uh-huh. there maybe is a hope for some techniques that uh-huh. that we aren't familiar with yet. Uh-huh. And so um, on the surface, I think super intelligence and alignment of super intelligence seems almost like a waste of time. But well, I think there's actually more um, of a possibility there than most people think. Yeah, so I think pretty much everyone in AI alignment research is in favor of interpretability, yeah. right? It's a uh, it's a, uh, a, a very, you know, consistent winner, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, the so, so there's a group at Anthropic that's doing amazing things on interpretability. You know, we have a group at OpenAI, you know, that has been able to do things like find in, inside of a language model, you know, a neuron that fires on concepts related to Canada, mm-hmm. okay, uh, which you know includes Montreal, or you know, you know, but also includes like the word color spelled with a U, right? You know, the more Canadian the mm-hmm. concept, the stronger right. it fires, right? But now the the worry is that that's a very special case just like in our own brains, right? That actually most concepts that you would care about uh, uh, do not map uh, to any single neuron or, or to, or to, or to anything that, that, that is, that is easily scrutable, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, And, and, you know, the, the, uh, so Chris Ola at Anthropic likes to talk about the problem of superposition. Mm -hmm. He doesn't mean quantum superpositions, you know, he means uh, most of the concepts that we care about are actually very, very complicated, you know, linear combinations of many, many activations 
registration rates. And uh, uh, it seems like a very, very challenging problem to identify all of these things. But I think we ought to push forward and we ought to see, you know, what are the limits of interpretability that we can hope for, right? There might be uh, there might be cases where just where interpretability just cannot work. Mm-hmm. So so the the sort of converse problem would be uh, backdoors, right? So so there is, so we have some evidence now that you can insert a backdoor into an AI model, which is basically a secret input that uh, uh, if if that input is provided, then it triggers this bizarre behavior, mm-hmm. right? But even if I showed you all the weights of the of the net of the uh, neural net, you would not be able to find that backdoored input efficiently, right. right? It would you would have to solve a cryptographically hard problem in order to find that backdoored input. Right. right. Okay. So so th- th- that would be an example where you know you might have hoped for interpretability to do something, but uh, but now it comes into conflict with with cryptography, literally, right? right? Where you just cannot. And and there's even mm-hmm. you know there's even the uh, uh, the opposite approach of that technique, mm-hmm. which is using it as a, essentially a hack, right? You mm-hmm. you contaminate a data set, mm-hmm. right, with this backdoor. Yeah, nobody. Uh, knows yeah, I mean, there. I mean, I mean, part of the challenge in this field is that just about everything is dual use, right? <laughs> right. You know, like right. like people say, well, we have to advance alignment and not advance capabilities, and I'm like, what what the hell? Like every you know, like like every genuine insight probably advances both. You know, maybe may, maybe some more. Than than the other, but uh, uh, but but you know, I, I mean, when when people started talking about backdoors, you know, I, I started saying, uh, well, backdoors could also be good for alignment, right? Imagine that we have a cryptographically obfuscated off switch, mm-hmm. you know, in our in our robot, and you know, when if the robot goes berserk and starts stabbing all the humans, right? Then we, you know, we we humans, we you know, we know this off switch, and even the robot itself, even if it suspects it might be there and it can modify its own weights, it it. it uh, it doesn't know wh- where that you back door is, it. right? So, so I've been thinking about that. So, 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 so back doors could be used for good, also. But you know, but 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 if if they are possible, then they are, then they do represent one limit to interpretability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what about what about maybe the opposite position mm. on intelligence? You know, mm. um, Russell and Norvig mm. have um, expressed not the belief, but postulated that maybe, you know, computational complexity of algorithms may prevent an intelligence explosion, meaning we won't see that sort of exponential growth scenario um, that that lead to a super intelligent system. Um, you know, as somebody who's a, uh, you know, computational complexity mm-hmm. expert, what are your thoughts on that position? So, I don't really see the case, and I, and I, and I'll tell you exactly why. Because when people talk about an intelligence explosion in the case of AI, they don't mean that it ha- it has to increase exponentially forever, right? That's that's not what anyone is talking about. Just like you know, if if someone in the uh, uh, imagine someone in the 1500s saying, well, you know, I like like maybe someday you know we'll be able to build uh, uh, these these you know horseless wagons that can go faster than humans, right? And then someone says, oh, but there are fundamental limits to how fast anything could go. I, I guess I'm imagining that they already knew relativity, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but uh, but you know, the that the, you know, it just uh, it just it just you know that there's not going to be this speed explosion or whatever. Okay, but you know, of course, in order to change the whole conditions of civilization you don't have to go infinitely fast you just have to go faster mm-hmm. than than humans or horses go mm-hmm. right and it's exactly the same here okay uh, uh, you don't necessarily need uh, your ai to be able to solve the halting problem to solve np complete problems right. in polynomial time to do these things that might be fundamentally impossible by any computer consistent with our laws of physics mm-hmm. right and and this is you know what computational complexity and theoretical computer science in general deal with. This is what I've spent most of my career thinking yeah, about. Yeah, it's your bread and butter. Right? It is my bread and butter. Uh, but uh, in order to change the world, an AI might, you know, merely need to be, you know, smarter than us, right? And, you know, of course, you know, we do have an existence proof that human level intelligence is compatible with the laws of physics, right? Mm-hmm. That's right here, right? That's between our skulls, right. okay? And uh, it, it, it would seem important 
plausible that you know the the human brain would represent the limit of intelligence that's allowed by the laws of physics. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, for God's sakes, right? Like our brains, you know, got you know in hominid evolution, got bigger and bigger, and then they stopped growing at some point just because of the width of the birth canal. Right, <laughs> or because of the energy that you need to to power a brain, right? You know, these are things that if you're building a giant data center, are no longer relevant. You're not constrained right? by that, absolutely. Right, and so so uh, uh, you know, could you uh, you know merely build something that is to to Einstein as Einstein is to most of us, let's mm -hmm. say, right? And and would that by itself be enough to change the world, right? And so then then you know, in in order to uh, uh, refute that, then people will go in this direction of oh well well you know intelligence isn't is actually not all it's cracked up to be and it's not it's not linear anyway uh, there's no linear scale of intelligence and uh, uh um uh, uh, you know, and 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 if you look at the smartest people, you know, you know, even you know Einstein or, or von Neumann, you know, they you know they did they, they didn't have that much actual power, right? So, <laughs> no. uh, but you know, I think if you could mass produce Einsteins, like uh, you know, you, you know, you're trying to convince me that that doesn't change anything, right? Right? right. It's like. Uh, 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 so, so, so I think, you know, the, the, you know, I, yes, there are massive uncertainties and yes, because of those uncertainties, I am not going to go on board with the Yudkowskian scenario, right? Which, which basically says we, we can be, you know, near certain that, that, you know, by default, these things just get rid of us. They just, you know, uh, use our atoms for, to do something better. They, right. they use them to, you know, they, they convert them into tiny little spirals or whatever objective function they're trying to maximize. Like, I don't know what they do. Mm -hmm. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, uh, but it but it seems like at any rate a world where where you can you know mass produce intelligences you know beyond Einstein's is is not the same world that we are used to, right. and and plunging into that world you know you could not describe it as a safe thing to do, whatever it is it might be good it might be bad but it's not safe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? I want to ask you about what what aspects of your previous work in theoretical mm. computer science did you find to be most helpful when thinking about the AI alignment problem? Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, uh, tough because uh, um, you know you know and and I, I, like I said, I was skeptical you know when I started that there would be anything. Uh, certainly, you know, uh, 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 quantum computing and mi modern machine learning have one enormous commonality that they are both based on linear algebra in very in very high dimensional spaces, right? And so, whatever intuitions you have about linear algebra, right? Uh, so, for example, you know the fact that like in in n dimensions, right? If I ask for vectors that are orthogonal to each other, I can only find n of them, mm -hmm. right? That's what it means to uh, uh, for space to be n dimensional in a sense. But uh, if I ask for vectors that are nearly orthogonal, okay, rather than perfectly orthogonal, suddenly there are exponentially more, that's right. right? And that's a central fact for quantum computing, and it's also a central fact for uh, for for modern AI. Uh, so, you know, that that problem of superposition that Chris Ola talks about in interpretability is, is literally that, right? That, uh, uh, you know, in an n-dimensional space, right, you could have an exponential and n, you know, number of uh, different features that are represented by uh, different nearly orthogonal linear combinations. Okay, so that's, that's one commonality. Now, um, you know, the most concrete thing that I found to work on in the last two years was uh, how do we watermark uh, the outputs of a, uh, of a right. language model? Uh, so, uh, you know, this was even before ChatGPT came out that I started thinking about this. Uh, and uh, I, I started thinking, wait, like, wait a minute, like, isn't every student in the world going to want to use this to, <laughs> to do their homework for them? <laughs> like, and isn't, you know, every spammer, you know, I, I get all so many s troll comments on my blog that I have to moderate, right? And, and uh, you know, sometimes people go into enormous effort to impersonate someone and, and you mm. know, and, and, you know, it's amazing that people have that much time, right? <laughs> But but I'm like, well, like, like isn't it? Couldn't GPT just automate this? 
couldn't it you know uh, uh, uh couldn't the the gru just spam every discussion forum with pro putin talking points right and i'm and really fast i'm familiar with your watermarking work but just just for everybody listening maybe briefly describe how it works absolutely so so uh so 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 we now face the problem of you know how can you tell whether a given piece of text came from a a, a language model or not right and there are you know uh, several approaches that you could imagine i mean one approach would be we just treat this as another ai problem right we just train a discriminator model to do as well as possible and this has been tried there's a, a startup company now uh, from a former undergrad at princeton named edward tian that's uh, uh, doing this uh, uh, and you know you can get above 90% accuracy this way uh, but you know there's a there's a considerable risk of false positives mm -hmm. right and and if you have a tool for like detecting what was written by ai like you can deal with false negatives, but you really don't want to be accusing a student of cheating mm -hmm. based on the output of your of your model and then be wrong about it, right? right. So, uh, so that's a, that's a big danger. Now, now another thing that you could do is uh, is you could just uh, have OpenAI or Anthropic or whatever store all of the uh, uh, completions that it generates, and then you could let people make queries. You know, did you generate this? Did you generate that? Uh, challenging to do that in a way that gives people assurances that their privacy is being protected, right? Uh, you know, now now in in practice, people have found all sorts of tricks. You know, the, I mean, I mean, homeworks have been turned in that contain text like as a large language model <laughs> trained by OpenAI, right? Or you know, people people notice that certain words like delve are yes. are, are are systematically favored by by chatbots, and so 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 sometimes there you know, and and even when, when I'm looking at my comment spam, you know, uh, uh, sometimes like I can I can I can tell like this looks like GPT wrote it. Right, uh, but you know, we want something more reliable. We want something that will continue to be reliable even as the LLMs get better and better. Which means, you know, like harder and harder to distinguish from human in, in particular. And so, so what watermarking means is that we want to slightly change the way that the LLM operates. Okay, and you know, we want to exploit the fact that LLMs are inherently probabilistic. Okay, so uh, uh, you know, if you, you if you give them the same prompt over and over, right, you you could get a different completion every time, uh, uh, um, unless you set this parameter of temperature to zero, right? Yeah. If you set the temperature to zero, then you're saying just Completely give me, yeah, yeah, make it deterministic. Give me what always give me what you consider the most probable, you know, continuation, right? But if the temperature is one, let's say, then you're saying just, just you know, calculate the what you think are the probabilities for each continuation, and then just give me a sample from that, from that distribution. Okay, so if you type the ball rolls down the, then maybe it's 99% hill, okay? But it could also be mountain, it could be ramp, right? There's, there's other things it could be. Uh, so, um, so, so now, you know, we want to use the fact that these models are probabilistic, right? That they're always making these random choices of how to continue, you know, which token to, uh, to, to put next. And we want to say, well, instead of making that choice randomly, why not make it pseudo randomly? Okay. So make it in a way that the end user would see nothing different, right? To them, it would look it, just it, like- It would feel the same. Yeah. It would look just, just like normal you know, GPT output. Uh, but uh, secretly, we are biasing some score that you can calculate later. Okay, at least if you know some and secret. And are you biasing yeah. towards, are you biasing like maybe some particular word or? Yeah, so, so okay, so, so, so the simple- so, so, so the simplest approach would be to bias specific words. But if you do that, then you're running the risk that people will be able to tell the difference, right? Because they'll see that those words are more common. So uh, a, a better thing to do would be to uh, bias certain, you know, combinations of five or six words, let's say, right? Uh, uh, that uh, uh, probably are not going to occur very often. Right, and so so that so that that is what we do in in the in the scheme that 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 I proposed, and uh, the 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 interesting part is that you can 
you can do this with sort of zero degradation of quality, right? So there's not a trade-off between watermarking and the quality of the right output. because there are many different ways to say the same thing. Yeah, yeah right, it. right, exactly. right. And 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 you can what you can do is you can use a pseudo random function mm -hmm. to you know pick the you know your combinations of five and six words that you're going to favor, and you can make it so that anyone who could tell the difference would have also been able to break that pseudo random function to distinguish it. In other words from a truly random function. Mm -hmm. um, and so now the, the interesting part is, is, well, how do you do that, but do it in a way where, where you're also biasing this score that you can calculate if you know the key of the pseudo-random function, uh, and you know, also in a way that is robust, meaning if the you know, student takes the GPT-written essay and they change a few words here and there, or they reorder some sentences or some paragraphs, right. uh, uh, we're still going to pick up the signal. Mm -hmm. Right. So, 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 so there is a scheme that does all of that, you know, and that, uh, um, you know, I, 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 I was able to do and I was able to analyze it just, you know, similar to how I would do other things in theoretical computer science. Right. What was nice about this problem is that I didn't have to look inside of the neural net. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> which, you know, which, uh, uh, you know, at that point I would have had no understanding of, of what's happening. Right. But here I'm just, I'm taking the list of probabilities output by the neural net as a black, I'm treating that as my black box. Right. And then I'm just, uh, 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 the, this little, thin interface of code between those probabilities and what the end user sees, that's the only part I'm tampering with. Right. And I'm tampering with it in a way that the end user shouldn't even notice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, so 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 that, you know, the, uh, there actually was an elegant story there. So I started telling people about that. And then uh, 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 within a year, like other people either built on uh, that idea or they had similar ideas independently, uh, which, you know, helped convince me that, yes, this was on the right track. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, after, after almost two years, this still has not been deployed by any of the LLM providers, but I am optimistic that things are finally happening. Well, stu students worldwide are glad yeah. this has not been <laughs> rolled out yet. Yeah, well, the 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 EU uh, AI Act might even mandate that this be done. And so, you know, I think we are heading toward a world where, you know, people now know that this can be done and where, you know, I think people are going to try it. Yeah. And uh, uh, now, you know, the, there, are, there are a lot of things to worry about. You know, one is who gets access to the detection tool, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you just give everyone access, then in particular, that means that a bad guy also gets access and they can just keep tweaking their document until it no longer triggers the detector. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, you know, you could worry about, well, what, a, you know, uh, are there people who should have a right to use an LLM without disclosing that they're doing it? What about uh, English as a second language speakers, you know, millions of whom are now relying on LLMs to improve the fluency of their English? Right. right? Uh, well, you know, I don't know how to design a watermark that only works on unsympathetic cases. <laughs> right. So, uh, uh, you know, and then you could worry, okay, you know, the, like, like for any watermark that we can design, Right, there will be workarounds. Right. right, I mean, you know, which could be as simple as you ask GPT to write your term paper, but in French, mm -hmm. and then you put it into Google Translate. Right, right, okay. And now, if you want to be robust against that, then we have to figure out how to watermark at the semantic level, we, we, which would mean going inside the neural net and 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 messing around with the weights. Right, uh, and I think that's a that's a great research problem. But you know, the question is, do we want to get started on what will surely end up being a a cat and mouse game? Yeah. Right. Well, you know, Google did that, you know, against all the people trying to game its search engine results. And, you know, they just accepted that that's what they would have to do. Mm -hmm. And so they've been doing it for 25 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? And so I think may maybe LLM providers will 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 end up having to do that as well. Yeah, my, my intuition is exactly what you said. It's mm. probably going to be very much an arms race, cat and mouse, mm. indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, this has just been unbelievably fantastic. I want to I wanna finish up with one last question, sure. Scott. Um, you know, after spending two years on AI alignment and uh -huh. working uh -huh. closely with OpenAI, uh -huh. um, how has your perspective on the future of AI changed? That's a, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, I think that, like, my massive update, you know, happened around 2021, 
2022, right? When I saw GPT-3, you know, and then I saw GPT-4, which was even more incredible. And, uh, you yeah, know, that I must saw, have been I really saw, special. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and yeah, no, I mean, I did get the privilege of seeing that like six months before most of the world did. And, you know, and I felt the, the frustration of people like uh, uh, on social media, like posting like, oh, GPT-3 is just a parrot. Look at this simple logic problem that it gets wrong. And I can try that same problem in GPT-4 and it gets it and I'm not allowed to tell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not used to that well, I as remember, an academic, right? I, I remember but, Donald Knuth so, even mm. was doing some of that. He mm. was posting some problems, they got it wrong, um, mm -hmm. and then four nailed it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So so um so I so I think, you know, and 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 I had, you know, for for 20, 30 years, I had, you know, played around with chatbots like Eliza and so forth. And 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 I, you know, when people said, Oh, this is just another Eliza, like I knew enough to know, no, no, this is a step change. This is maybe the biggest scientific surprise of my lifetime so far. That this that you just, you know, use a neural net to predict all the text on the internet and you scale it up enough and it works. I completely right? agree with that. So um so 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 I feel like 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 you know after I make that update then something has to be really special to make me up, want to update again right <laughs> So uh, I I think that that since I, I I mean what once I saw that in you know 2021 22 right like it's within my set of possibilities that by 2024 right maybe it's just doing my research for me it's writing my papers for me right and so now I you know I should update on the fact that we're not there Right. Uh, actually, LLMs have continued to get better, but you know, in in almost two years, no one, you know, it, it it's not clear that that anyone has beaten GPT four by that much, mm -mm. right? Nope. And you know, and, and of course, you know, people are going to continue scaling, but you know, as they scale, they're going to run into uh, well, number one, you know, limits on energy. <laughs> Number two, you know, limits on GPUs, on how many GPUs can be manufactured, you know, in the world. And then number three, limits on training data, right? right. Uh, we are running out of internet to feed into these things. You know, I mean, there is all of TikTok and Instagram that hasn't been fully exploited yet, but, you know, that might just make the model dumber, <laughs> I right? Think, I, think you I think it probably would. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so it's not clear, you know, you know, and, 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 and there is a thesis that, well, people will get more clever in how they exploit all the, all the data and the compute that they have. And, you know, and, and there's precedent for that, right? There have been algorithmic advances as well. I mean, you know, the invention of transform in 2017 being a, a prominent example. And surely there will be uh, uh, further advances. But, you know, we don't actually know how, 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 how far this is going to go. You know, if we're thinking about uh, aligning superintelligence, you know, we don't actually know how long we have, right? It's, it's still plausible that we could have 50 years or more, right? Uh, or, or, you know, I, I have other friends who are very worried that we have less than five years, right? Uh, now, now, you ask, like, what what has changed in my in my views in the last two years? I, I think maybe you know one of the main things that that, that changed uh, uh, changed because of the 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 now famous OpenAI board drama in uh, 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 this past November, right when. Uh, um, you know, we really saw, uh, you know, some of the implications of, of OpenAI's, like, unusual structure, right? The fact that it's this for-profit, you know, being under the control, at least on paper, of a non-profit non foundation, yeah. you know, uh, uh, who's, who's, you know, that, that, that's motivated not by financial return, but by the interests of humanity. And then that nonprofit board sort of tried to assert itself in a very dramatic fashion, uh, uh, firing Sam Altman with uh, basically no warning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, uh, and then over like uh, this, this very tumultuous weekend, uh, you know, Sam was then you know so so you know uh, um, um, more than ninety percent of the employees rebelled. They said that they they might leave for Microsoft if if you know Microsoft just hires Sam and the whole company would be reconstituted as a division of Microsoft. And then uh, the board capitulated and uh, and Sam was brought back. 
And uh, so, uh, you know, there are many, many lessons that people have drawn from that and will continue to draw from that, right? By the way, I, I, was, I was in Texas the whole time, so I'm just, you know, s seeing, you know, seeing the messages. But, you know, like, like they, you know, I, I have, I know people who are just there in the building, like, like you know, overnight uh, 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 dealing with this. But uh, one of the main lessons that I drew, drew from it is that uh, if if there is ever to be uh, uh, a slowdown or a pause or you know uh, you know the the kind of thing that Eliezer Yudkowsky wants, let's say, right, the, you know, a, a sort of pulling back mm -hmm. from you know uh, uh, progress in AI, uh, then it is not going to happen on the basis of someone having bad vibes, right, or someone saying you know oh well like you know I don't I don't fully trust this person, right, or or uh, uh, you know I can't put my finger on it, but uh, you know I think I think things are moving too fast. Uh, I think what it's going to take is you know either unfortunately a catastrophe. Which you know doesn't mean you know destroying the world, but you know some AI caused you know Chernobyl, you know like right. like you know like massively you know bad event, or short of that, uh, uh, you know in some controlled condition, someone does an experiment that makes it clear that that could happen, right? So they do gain of function research with AI, right, and they show well look you know this AI you know helped you know this group of complete simpletons make a chemical weapon. Right then, and they they would never have been able to without the AI's mm -hmm. help, mm -hmm. or you know, or or this this AI, you know, in this simulated scenario, it was able to hack in you know in, into all of these servers and take control of them, and uh, you know, if we released it into the world, and then this is what it would do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, so so it, it, I think that 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 you know, to me, the 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 importance of uh uh what's um. What's called a uh, 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 warning shots or uh, um, 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 like understanding capabilities in advance, right? Is uh, a, a, a has has gone up. Mm -hmm. I, I I now feel like that might be just more than half of the entire alignment problem, mm -hmm. just to have you know a very clear understanding of what systems are going to do before they are deployed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, we do have groups at OpenAI that are doing exactly that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would, I would love if, if theory could figure out ways to improve their ability to do, uh, to do that. Yeah. Well, I, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit um, offline, but, you know, AI alignment was not something we took that seriously right. back in the 90s. We were just trying to get things to work. Yep. And now I think, uh, like everybody really serious about AI, I think is one of the most important questions out there in the world. Um, well, Scott, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Hidden Layers. This series is hosted by Kung Fu AI, a management consulting and engineering firm focused exclusively on artificial intelligence. If you have any questions or thoughts about today's episode, or if you know someone we should feature, please visit us at kungfu.ai.